So you'd think, you would think that writing object-oriented code was hard. All you have to do is look at our apps. Okay? We mean well, and but we write code that almost always, inevitably, inevitably, we eventually come to hate it. And the more I think about this, like these days somehow my job is to think about how to write better code. And the more I think about it, the more I think that all of the problems we cause have the same simple solution. And that when people ask me now, when people ask me how to write object-oriented code, I tell them, I give them one small piece of advice. I say, make smaller things. That's all it is. Make smaller classes, make smaller methods, and let them know as little about each other as possible. And lately, I've been on a quest. I've had this obsession for the last couple of months, and it's been about conditionals. There's a lot of code out there with nasty conditionals in it. And I've been wondering, when should I replace conditionals with small objects? And how should I do this? And what will happen to my code if I do? And I was at RubyConf in Miami in November, and I inflicted this obsession upon Jim Wyrick, whom some of you probably knew. And he pointed me in the direction of the Gilded Rose. Now, this is a kata. It's apparently really well known, but I don't get out much, so I had <laughs> never heard of it. And so it's, it's so famous that you can just Google it and uh, get an explanation of the problem. But I didn't do that. I, I wanted to treat this problem as if it was a real production problem and that my only source of information was the tests and the code. And so I uh, looked at his, I, I checked it out of his repo, and I looked at the problem, and I was so interested in it that it became the skeleton around which I, I have hung the ideas for today's talk. Um, I have altered his code just a little bit, but it's just to make it easier to talk about. This really is the Gilded Rose kata. And here's how it goes. There's a Gilded Rose class, and it's structured like this. It has attributes for name, quality, and days remaining. It sets those in an initializer, and then there's a tick method. Now, here's the tick method. Well, actually, no, that's just the first half of it. Here's the rest. Now, I know you can't read this. You should, well, don't even try, even if you can. All right, This is the whole method. I just want you to get some sense of the size and shape of it. It's a 43-line if statement. And this seems really, really hard to me, but I am known to be Boolean impaired. So I know that my subjective sense of how difficult this is to understand is probably not correct. And so instead I ran, I used some metrics. I ran a complexity metric called flog against it. So flog is a metric. Okay, what's a metric? A metric is a crowdsourced idea about something, right? I have my own opinion about how compl complex this is, but I can use this sort of wisdom of the crowd metric, the, uh, the flog metric, which scores, it's an ABC metric, so it scores assignments, branches, and conditionals. It just counts things and adds them up. Higher scores are worse. They indicate uh, more complex code, code that's going to be harder to understand and reason about. And so Flog says this Gilded Road class scored a 50, and that one method, Tick, scored a 45. Yeah, it just hurts, doesn't it? So, so Flog says it's complicated. But before we go on, I want to introduce another, a very subjective metric about complexity. So I spend a lot of time these days going... Um, going to places and looking at code I know nothing about. People call me up, and I go to their shop, and I spend a few days. And as you might imagine, no one calls me if things are going well. Right? And when I get there, they don't ask me to look at the code they're proud of. They ask me to look at the most heinous bits of their apps, the, the things that have sort of complex, lengthy context and history, code that has just absolutely gotten out of hand. And not only are the explanations long and confusing because the problem is hard, but they do that thing we all do. You know that thing you do when you're trying to, when you have to explain a bit of code that you wrote that you're embarrassed about to someone? You don't just tell them how it works. You feel compelled to explain all the reasons why it got that way. Right? You laugh. I do it. I know you do it too, right? It just hurts. We hate that. And so these explanations are long and confusing, and they have lots of sort of, you know, sideways kind of information. And there's a point in time, I really mean well, but there's a point in time during every explanation when I start feeling like that dog, Ginger, in this Gary Larson's cartoon where I, it starts turning into blah, 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 Sandy, blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly I get startled back into awareness when I hear them say, so... What do you think we should do about this line of code? And it used to terrify me, right? I felt like I had to understand everything in order to help with anything. 
But it turned out, after a few trips, I realized that there was a really simple thing I could do that would help me identify code that they could benefit from changing. And I call this the squint test. <laughs> Here's how it works. You squint your eyes, and you lean back, and you look the code. 